really terrific, and you will all be very delighted um, with the program. Um, I heard the recital, and uh, it just blew me away. Uh, good evening. My name is Nicholas Karides, and I am a director of the Hellenic American Cultural Foundation. Tonight we have a wonderful program, paying tribute to the life and music of Maria Callas. She is considered one of the greatest stars of opera, and to this day continues to inspire young musicians. We are fortunate to have with us this evening Nicholas Gage, who will begin the evening with a presentation on her background and accomplishments. Nick Gage needs no introduction. An accomplished author, journalist, and producer, Nick devoted the first part of his illustrious career to being an investigative reporter, and the second part to writing seven books and producing several films. He was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize six times and received numerous awards. Nick is a man for all seasons. The range and breadth of his literary accomplishments are extraordinary. His most recent book, Greek Fire, the story of Maria Callas and Aristotle Onassis documents the fateful romance of two of the most famous Greeks of the 20th century, and the book won wide acclaim. The Washington Post reviewed the book, describing it as illuminating, not only for its subjects, but the craft of biography as well. Nick has also written other significant books, but for me, his book on Eleni, the account of the life and death of his mother during World War II of smuggling her children out to safety in America remains one of the finest literary achievements. He has received numerous awards and it was translated into 26 languages. Eleni was also made into a movie and more recently into an opera. A number of years ago, Nick gave an event for the foundation on his book, Eleni. The auditorium was packed, and during his entire presentation, you could hear a pin drop. Highly unusual for a New York City event. No one wanted to miss a word, which confirms that when Nick Gage speaks, everyone listens. The second part of the event tonight is focused on performers who have been inspired by the talents of Maria Callas. We are particularly grateful to another one of the Foundation's board members, Maria Asriadu, for putting together this portion of the evening tonight. Maria is a talented, tireless, and accomplished musician and pianist. As the New York Times said, Maria is an acclaimed social, soloist, chamber musician, and pedagogue, and is an artist with intense personality, virtuoso flair, unusual poise, and intimate contact with style. She has suggested a number of musical events for the foundation and has participated in many of them. When we have asked Maria where could we find musicians to perform such sophisticated pieces, Maria said, no problem, as her students from the Juilliard School and the Manhattan School of Music are always ready, willing, and waiting for an opportunity to perform. Tonight is no exception. We could have found more established musicians and artists who have performed in the tradition of Maria Callas. What we wanted to do this evening is to share with you the unbelievable talent we have in these young musicians. Sophia Pelakakis, a mezzo soprano, a George, Georgia uh, Liadu, pianist, and Christophoros Petritis, violinist. And I do want to say that uh, Christophoros will be playing tonight on an 18th century Italian um, violin. Uh, so we really will work in uh, the history um, into uh, this performance. Um, each of these performers, musicians, have connections to Greece have already received numerous awards 
and is, are studying for additional degrees at the Manhattan School of Music, the Juilliard School, Cutstown University. As you will see, the legacy of Maria Callas is thriving today. These three performers will present music from the Romantic era, including some of Maria Callas' favorite arias. They will perform works which illustrate Callas' extraordinary dedication to music, her dramatic personality, and her exceptional artistry. The program has been carefully chosen to embody the essential qualities of which Maria Callas will be remembered and treasured. As you are aware, for organizations and foundations like our cultural foundation, the future of these entities is in the young performers and the next generation. Tonight, we want to share with you both the background and musical accomplishments of Maria Callas and the incredible talent of our future stars. The structure of the evening is for Nick Gage to provide the background of Maria Callas and her accomplishments and to play a few video um, clips of Callis's past performances, and they're really absolutely wonderful. After that, we will have about an hour of performances of some of Callis's famous arias by these three young musicians. There will be no intermission. We will, however, end with a nice reception for everyone on, on the second floor of the building, and we hope you all will join us. Thank you, and let me give you Nick Gage. Thank you and good evening. I want to assure, uh, I saw some worried faces. I want to assure you, despite the affectionate way I was caressing the piano, I will not play a note or <laughs> sing a note <laughs> tonight. I will only uh, give you an uh, overview of the amazing life and talent of Maria Callas. When Maria Callas died 46 years ago this month, on September 16, 1977, Harold Schoenberg, the, the then music critic of the New York Times, summed up her life best in my view. Callous, he wrote, blazed through the skies and was burned out early, but what amazing years those were. What she accomplished in those brief years has not been equaled by any other performer in the history of opera. As I wrote in my biography of her, Greek Fire, her skills as a singer and actress so completely reinvigorated and transformed her art that her admirers now speak of opera as before Callas and after Callas. Michelle Crystal, the former critic, uh, artistic director of the Washington National Opera, called her the performer who changed the standard by which all other opera singers are judged. Leonard Bernstein went even further, calling her the Bible of opera. Noel Coward wrote in his diary after witnessing one of her performances at Covent Garden, she is one of the few great artists that I've ever seen in my life. Her most fervent fans worshipped her as La Divina, the Divine One, and many shared the sentiments <laughs> of Italian musicologist Attila Ciampe, who wrote, during the 10 years of her unquestioned reign between 1949 and 1959, she bestowed upon the world more music, more art, more humanity, and warmth than any other individual in the 20th century. Here is the great diva singing two famous arias Costa Diva from Norma and Visa de Latte from Tosca.
I think she deserves a posthumous applause, right? <laughs> what made Maria Callas the unique musical artist that we just saw? She was born with a prodigious musical gift, her phenomenal voice, of course. Here's how one of her early teachers described that voice when she was still a teenager. Quote, it swirled and flared like a flame and filled the air with melodious reverberation like a carido. But what, but what gave Maria the discipline and determination to hone her talent to such a razor sharp edge were traumatic experiences in her, life, in her childhood and youth that left her career her only solace and refuge. Maria Callas was born here in New York City at Flower Fifth Avenue Hospital on December 2, 1923, four months after her parents, George Kalogeropoulos and his pregnant wife, Evangelia, called Litsa, arrived in Manhattan with their six-year-old daughter, Yakinthi, later to be known as Jackie. Her mother had hoped Maria would be a boy to take the place of the son she had lost to meningitis three years earlier, and was so disappointed to learn that she had given birth to a girl that she refused to look at the baby for four days. The family lived in Astoria for the first three years and then settled in an apartment at 192nd Street in Washington Heights. After George opened his own pharmacy in Manhattan and shortened his name first to Carlos and then Callas. The future Duva's birth certificate, in fact, lists her name as Sophie Cecilia Callos. But when she was baptized three years later at Holy Trinity Cathedral in Manhattan, she was given the name Maria Anna Cecilia Sophia Kalogeropoulos. Quite a mouthful. Maria had an unhappy childhood because her, she was stocky, myopic, and plain, and her mother, Lisa, favored her much prettier sister, Jackie. Her home life was turbulent because her mother quarreled continuously with her father and focused on developing the budding musical talents of her daughters. By 1937, her Parents' marriage had unraveled so badly that as soon as Maria finished the eighth grade that spring, Lisa took her, told her husband she was leaving him and taking her daughters back to Greece, where her family would help provide proper musical education for the girls. The reaction of her husband to the news shows how badly the couple's marriage had disintegrated by then. He knelt down, his daughter later recalled, crossed himself and said, at last, my God, you have pitied me. <laughs> Lisa had not anticipated the problems she would, uh, that would await them in Greece. First, her relatives made it clear they would not be able to help financially. And then she discovered that Maria, at 13, was too young to be enrolled at the Conservatory of Athens, the best in Greece, and had to settle for the second best, the National Conservatory, where two years later, while only 15, she would be given the demanding role of Santuza in Cavaliere Rusticana and wind up winning the school's first prize for opera. Just as she turned 16 in December of 1939, Maria won a scholarship to the more prestigious Conservatory of Athens after performing an audition before the famous Spanish soprano, Elvira de Hildago, who had taken a position at the school after civil war broke out in her own country in 1936. The Hildago's first sighting of Maria was, has become a staple of the callous legend. She looked at the unhappy child, fat, pimply, nervously biting her fingernails, and dismissed her as having no present whatsoever. But then she later said, the very idea of the girl wanting to become a, a singer was laughable. 
Then Maria opened her mouth to sing, Ocean, thou mighty monster from Olympus Oberon. The Regado closed her eyes and was overcome by violent cascades of sound full of drama and emotion. And she immediately understood what Maria could become. From that moment, the Hildago became Maria's teacher, mentor, and substitute mother. Maria needed someone other than her own mother to rely on when World War II broke out in Athens and, and the country was occupied by German and Italian troops. Maria's mother took her own desperate survival measures. She indiscriminately invited Italian and German officers to her house embarked on an affair with one of the Italians and encouraged her daughters to go out with any officers who took a liking to them and might give them money or food. Maria told several close friends later that she never slept with any of the men, but she felt her mother was trying to prostitute her and her sister, and her resentment grew so much over time that she refused to have anything to do with her mother for the last 26 years of her life. During those difficult years, her substitute mother, the Hildago, came to Maria's rescue, securing parts for her with the Greek National Opera, allowing Maria to earn a small salary. And in the summer of 1942, when she was still only 19, she made a debut in a leading role in Tosca. At the end of the war, the Hildago advised her to go to Italy to build her career, but she decided to return to the United States, both to see her father and to audition for the Metropolitan Opera. On the return, she did manage to get an audition at the Met and, went <coughs> and it was even offered a contract, but it was the kind given to beginners and she turned it down. After se several unsuccessful efforts to find a showcase for her talent in the US, she borrowed money in 1947 and sailed for Italy for a singing engagement in Verona that would pay her only $240 for four performances. Then she met, there she met a balding, pudgy, Veronese businessman and opera buff more than twice her age named Giovanni Battista Menenghini. He befriended her, then married her and guided her career until she became the reigning deity of Italian opera. Her big moment came in Venice in 1949. She had been hired by Tullio Serafin, the celebrated conductor of the Teatro La Fenice, to sing the demanding role of Brunhilde in Die Walkuri, and another soprano was singing Elvira in Puritani. The other singer became Ill, Ill and the desperate Serafin made Maria sight read one of Elvira's arias and suddenly informed her you're going to sing Puritani next week. She knew nothing of the part, and the Bellini opera could not have been more different from the Wagner. But Maria did the part and did it brilliantly, which <coughs> was considered a miracle. That success changed the course of Callas's career and reaw reawakened interest in the long neglected bel canto repertoire. With a priceless voice and range, she resurrected operas like Luce de la Mamor. La Solombuna, Anna Bolena, and Medea that had been neglected for decades for lack of performance able to do them justice. And she became the toast of the op opera world. What made Callas a legend in the decade that followed was not only her talent as a singer, but her instinct as an actress. She really brought acting to opera. The Greek director Alexis Minotis often told the story how astonished she was while staging Medea in Dallas with Maria to see her at a critical moment in rehearsal fall to her knees and pound the floor in frenzy. What are you doing, Minotis and demanded. Do you like it, she asked. I was going to tell you to do exactly that because that's what the ancient Greeks did uh, to call on the gods. How did you know? Maria responded, I didn't know. I did it because it felt right at the moment. Minotis said he shivered when she told him that. But Callas knew as an artist and a perfectionist that no matter how good an actress she was, she could hardly be convincing portraying the frail Madame Butterfly and the consumptive 
Violetta while weighing over 220 pounds. So in 1953, she astounded the world once again by dropping 65 pounds from an Amazonian frame and em emerging as an exotic willowy beauty who soon drew the attention not only of opera lovers, but international society as well. As her fame soared, she came to believe that God singled her out for an exceptional gift, and throughout the 1950s, she poured her energy into her music as a nun would into her devotions. I feel privileged to have had destiny other than the ordinary, she said. I am a creature of destiny. But being a pawn of destiny often left Maria lonely and frustrated, despite the attention leap, heaped upon her. For it seemed everyone close to her, including her husband, cared only for her voice. And while she struggled to serve that voice, part of, part of her remained unsatisfied. There's a, then as the, day came, uh, the decade came to a close, her voice too began to betray her. The reason for the deterioration of the voice is a matter of continuing debate. Some blame it on her dramatic loss of weight. Others on misguided training when she was young. Giulietta Simonato, the mezzo-soprano who was Maria's lifelong colleague and friend, told me when I was researching my book that Maria once asked her with pointed directness why her voice would wobble beyond control. I told her, Simonato said, you sang strong roles too young. The diaphragm is a muscle like an elastic. Forcing this muscle at a young age, Maria had totally impoverished it. When you lose elasticity, there's nothing you can do, neither rest nor study, nothing. But most plain, the only man Maria Callas ever loved, shipping tycoon Aristotle Nassis for ruin, ruining her voice and destroying her career. They believed that Maria poured all her energy into her art until she met the man who would ignite passionate love in her for the first time. But because of that love, her devotees believed she squandered her unique talent to devote herself to her, her insensitive paramour who strung her along for nine years, forced her to have an abortion when she became pregnant with his child and then rejected her to marry a woman even more famous than she was, Jackie Kennedy. All these perceptions of the diva and the tycoon are, of course, cliches forged by decades of misinformation published about them. Although there is a core of truth in many cliches, Maria Callas and Arsala Narsas as well, they were, not, they were uh, a lot more complicated and vulnerable than their legends suggest. Their, affair, uh, their love affair was quite different than uh, the inaccurate story everybody knows. In fact, although their relationship was certainly tempestuous, for both of them, it was the deepest and longest lasting commitment of their lives, as I found out when I researched my book about them. The affair began on July 22, 1959, when Onassinus and his wife invited Callas and her husband on a three-week cruise on the Yacht Christina from Monte Carlo to Istanbul. During the course of that, screw, uh, of that odyssey, Callas and Onassis fell in love, and their marriages dissolved before the alarmed eyes of their passengers, who included Sir Winston Churchill and his wife, Lady Clementine. Maria became pregnant during that cruise, and later she told friends that Onassis forced her to have an abortion, despite her lifelong desire for a child. But during research for my book on the couple, I found legal papers, including the baby's birth and death certificate, a photograph of the dead baby, and testimony from Maria's loyal maid that she never had an abortion but gave birth to a son eight months after the cruise ended. The child was born and died on the same day, March 30, 1960, and Maria returned, mourned at his grave for the rest of her life. The baby died because it was taken by cesarean section in the eighth month and, the, and his lungs were not strong enough. Maria never told anyone except a few intimates, but much later when she had been deserted for Jackie Kennedy, it was easy for her to tell of an abortion that had been forced upon her 
making Onassis the villain. In fact, Onassis' closest friends told me that despite his marriage to Jackie, Maria Callas remained the love of his life. He spoke, of her, he spoke to her almost daily and had his people look after her finances and travel arrangements. He frequently visited her in Paris, even sharing a dinner with her uh, last uh, boyfriend, Giuseppe Di Stefano. He bought Maria her apart, uh, apartment in Paris, although Callas never exploited him for his money. And far from ruining her, music, uh, his, her musical career, Narcissus always prodded Maria to keep performing. But Maria wanted to give up singing because her voice began to betray her before she met him and became uncontrollable. It was Onassis, in fact, after the death of their baby, who arranged for her to give the two most famous closing performances of her career at the theater of Epidaurus, where only the tragedies of Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides had been staged previously. In the first performance, on August 24, 1960, Maria chose her signature role, her favorite, Norma, the tragic Tuart princess who decided to murder her two children as they sleep to take revenge against the lover who betrayed her, but is so moved at the sight of them that she changes her mind and offers up her own life in a fiery ritual of atonement. Gallus gave a heartbreaking performance that uh, night and it, that became one of the legends of her career. The critics called it a miracle and some detected new t tenderness, a real mother's feelings, as one put it, in the way she interacted with the children on the stage. The second performance this came a year later, <coughs> and the opera chosen was another tragic story of a woman betrayed, Medea. Many celebrities came from near and far to witness the production, including the conductor Thomas Schippers, La Scala's general manager, Donio Gingirelli, and Wally Toscanini, who later told, told young Carlo Minotti, as I watched Maria, I began to cry because I, I knew what she was going through. She was losing her, losing her voice and Onassis was there. You could almost see the blood coming out of her vocal cords. She gave an in, in, incandescent performance out of despair. All she wanted was to be loved. Onassis came to recognize the value of that love, but all too late. He reportedly tried to get Jackie to give him a divorce and consulted divorce lawyers in both Athens and New York until the shock of his son's death brought on his final illness. As his condition grew worse, he rejected Jackie's advice to go to a hospital in New York and chose instead to go to the American hospital in Paris where Maria lived because he wanted to see her one last time. As death drew near, Onassis apparently did arrange to, for Maria to come to the hospital to see him when both Jackie and his daughter were away. He, told, he held her hand, Maria, Maria later recalled, and told her, I love you, Maria, not always well, but as much as and as best I could, I tried. Onassis died on March 15, 1975, and, would, and was buried on his private island of Scorpius where he and Maria spent some of their happiest moments. After his death, Callas became almost a recluse and died of a heart attack only two years later. She was 53 years old. But while the tumultuous life of Maria Callas ended, the legend of La Divina lives on. Her recordings sell as well 40 years, 46 years after her death as they did when she was alive and she remains the fiery definition of the diva as artist. And now you will see another unimpeachable reason why Kala singing Sutta La Monte from Verdi's Emanuel. Thank you. Thank you again, Nick. This was really a terrific um, setting for the musical portion that will now begin. The, these videotapes and the videos are just extraordinary, and they certainly bring chills watching them. 
Um, we have an incredible program for you. It'll probably run probably 45 minutes um, to even an hour, but we're not going to have um, an intermission. We want to keep it all together. So let us bring out our musicians um, and set the stage, and you will be thrilled at what you hear.
Thank you.